going to start with uh, um, Professor Madhura Suminathan from the Indian Statistical Institute of Bangalore, and she's going to start us off, I'm sure, with a uh, really rousing beginning. Uh, it's nice to be back at Somerville. I'm an old Somervillian, so <laughs> and glad to see there's this conference on uh, here. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the case study, which is of the uh, public distribution system of food, uh, also called the PDS for short in India. And I'm not sure there's a very interesting mixed audience, so some of it may be repetitive for some of you, but, uh, but uh, bear with me briefly. Uh, public distribution started in India, uh, it was started by the British as a wartime rationing measure in 1942. And then in the mid-60s, uh, as part of a major, I think, overhaul of uh, food security in India from the production side and the distribution side, uh, it was announced that it's going to be, not that it became overnight, a universal program of food rationing. Um, so that was in the mid-60s, the same time as we had uh, the Food Corporation of India, the setting up the Commission on Agricultural Costs and Prices. So very much a time when producers and consumers were seen together as part of the food security system. And that's one of the points I want to sort of make today, that we have to keep you know, both concerns of producers and consumers in mind. Uh, then we come to the mid-90s and uh, post-liberalization when we had what we call the targeted public distribution system. Uh, essentially targeting, I think all of you know, I mean, was introduced with only one purpose and that was to reduce the government's expenditure, public expenditure. So it's very much driven by uh, neoclassical fiscal policy. And the third major change of the last 60 years is 2013 when we have I think India is unique. We have the National Food Security Act, which actually makes it a sort of makes food access to food a basic human right. And although, as far as I'm concerned, it's diluted as to what some of us would have wanted, and some of us who uh, fought for this, but it now assures uh, subsidized food to about uh, two thirds of the uh, Indian population. So. We've really come through a, a major uh, changes in the system over the years. And I've just put up some numbers for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, it's actually huge. As of now, this is the latest data I could get from May, 731 million persons are covered. There are half a million fair price shops. And the quantity of grain distributed is 51 million plus, mainly rice and wheat. So we're talking really about a huge program and uh, the only other, I mean, the largest food program in India and in, in the world in terms of expenditure, of course, is the US food stamp program. Uh, and that's, that overtakes India in terms of expenditure. So our financial outlay is a very important point um, for me and as an economist. A financial outlay last year or this year is, uh, well, you can read the numbers, uh, uh, whatever, million rupees. And I just took the old conversion, not the new post-Brexit rate, 100 rupees to a pound, and you get up, come to something easier, 11,000 million pounds. So 11,000 to 13,000 million pounds is the kind of expenditure we're talking about. Uh, the US is, was in 2014, $74 billion. All of you know what cap subsidies to... UK are, so these numbers are not very large. So the first question, I'm going to sort of three points that Alfie said we should raise. First question is, is the PDS affordable? And I think this is a very relevant question. And if you're going to ask about that, you have to know how much are we spending and who are we spending it on? So to me, the first question is, who are the food insecure? and we have different numbers doing the rounds, and I'm sure in this room there are many other numbers. I'm, I just give you a glimpse of three numbers. The first, which I would call the lower limit of food insecure, is if you actually look at the numbers who are stunted or underweight, already malnourished, 
So, I mean, there's no question. These are people, you know, men, women, children already suffering, and that comes to roughly 30% of India's population. I've just done very ballpark numbers to, for us to get this perspective. So we're talking about 363 million people who are suffering malnutrition. The second number, oops, sorry, we don't need to go into all that, all of you are familiar with, is uh, what the National Food Security Act 2013 has defined as people who are food insecure in India, or for whom the right to food still needs to be ensured. And that act has taken 75% of our rural population and 50% of our urban population, which works out to about two thirds of the total population, or about 800 million. So that's the middle number. And what's the third number? The third number, I think I'm going to show you is, is, is a, a, a different slide. How does the world define food insecure? And the US, as I said, has the biggest food security program in the world. The US definition is all those who spend more than one third of their budget on food. I'm very grateful for a number this morning. I think it was Tara's presentation. She said, I think it was UK, though she didn't put it up, 11% of the household budget is spent on food. So that's what you know, most of us in this room are spending on food. What does the Indian expenditure on food look like? Sorry, I come from a statistical institute, so let me, I hope the numbers are large enough. So if you look at these numbers, uh, what, they, what they tell you is rural and urban, the population is ranked by deciles or fractiles of monthly per capita expenditure, the poorest 5%, next 5 to 10%, next decile, and so on, till the top 5%. And the numbers in the other two columns tell you the share of the monthly household expenditure spent on food. And I think if we take the one third, that anybody spending more than one third is food insecure, then I don't think, I don't know if there's a pointer here. Is there a pointer? Okay, yeah. So you see, only the top 5% of the rural population and roughly the 10% of the urban population. These are the people we can say we don't have to worry about their food insecurity. 5% of India's rural population, 10% of India's urban population. Okay, if you say, you know, we are not the US, we can't aspire to those things. Let's go to China. What was the criterion used in China? It was 50% of your household budget. If you're spending more than 50%, I mean, let's think of it a different way. One accident in the family, one health expenditure, if you're spending 50% of your budget on food, that month you're going to have to, your food consumption is going to be affected if you have to spend on, on medical care or something else, or one person is unemployed or in any other uh, contingency you can think of. So if you take the China criterion, then it's, these are the people spending less than 50%, so the top 20% of the rural and 50% of the uh, urban. So, oh, I had that number somewhere. Um, okay. Yeah, 854 million persons. So that's pretty close to the National Food Security Act number. So, but I think this is very important. We're talking about 800 million people. And how much are we spending on the public distribution system, which is India's biggest food security program? And again, I don't want to go into numbers, but we're spending less than 1% of GDP. So I think we, you know, things we're going to talk about here, and I, I'm going to talk about it too a little bit if there's time. Um, more nutritious food, expanding the food basket. Yes, we have to think about this, and let's not be constrained by the expenditure because what we're actually spending is minuscule compared to the problem of hunger and malnutrition in India. So that's the first point I want to make. Now, the obvious question, I mean, many people in India have and elsewhere is, but is this the right way to do it? If you're spending this money, not so much. Please don't say so much money because you're spending this minuscule amount of our GDP. 
but still it's about 11,000 million pounds. So if you're spending this, is this wasteful, inefficient, et cetera? And I want to say here that the numbers on waste and inefficiency are hugely exaggerated in mainstream media and the press and many I mean, of my tribe of economists too. In 19, I don't know which year, in the early 80s sometime, Rajiv Gandhi said that for every rupee spent on the public distribution system, only one quarter reaches the people. Now, two years ago, our economic advisor said the same thing. I looked at who he's citing. He's citing somebody, who's citing somebody, who's citing somebody. I haven't found the study which is giving this number. But we're all saying it's wasteful. Only one in four, you know, one fourth of the expenditure reaches the people, so let's do something else. Even if it was true when Rajiv Gandhi said it, uh, uh, maybe it was, but 25 years later, I mean, there, there must, things have changed. Has somebody done a study to show the waste and inefficiency? And I believe there was some talk about Food Corporation of India, and there's always talk in the media about rotting you know, uh, tons of grain. Two to three percent of the Food Corporation of India's grain is wasted. That's high, but that's not 60 million tons or 20 million tons. So we have to have, and I don't know, the people from the corporate sector here, I mean, is one or two percent too much in terms of waste in, in their operation. I'm not saying we should keep it, but we have to have some perspective on this. Uh, the second is this whole idea of waste and inefficiency. Um, you know, how do you define inefficient? And again, as an economist, and I think here people who are a lot of people working on environmental issues, what may be inefficient for economists may not be inefficient for environmentalists. So our whole concept of inefficiency, and again, I want to make a point here because we are going to be talking about large institutions like the Food Corporation of India and their so-called inefficiency. Uh, we once did a study comparing a private and a public um, food grain storage or similar, similar operation. I've got five minutes. Okay, I'm going to skip this and, uh, and just say that the public sector follows certain social norms and that's what raises its cost. So it's not, it's not inefficient. Okay. So this is the first point I want to make on fiscal outlays. They are minuscule compared to the problem of malnutrition in India. So the PDS is very much affordable. The second is, but can we change it? Should it be cash transfers, kind transfers? And I think that um, all of us who worked in developing countries know that inflation, particularly food price inflation, is a very serious problem. And the whole problem with cash transfers is that you have no control over inflation. So you may give cash transfers, but unless you're revaluing the amounts every few weeks, you're not going to get the real benefit to the other side. Um, now, another impact of the public distribution system, which is actually not very widely accepted when people who talk about, let's do away with this, let pay pe people cash, let them spend it on what they want, why should we distribute kind, is we wouldn't have the kind of price stability we have in India compared to say any Latin American country or any other, many most developing countries, we wouldn't have the price stability if we didn't have the Food Corporation of India. There's a huge intervention in the food grain market is one of the key factors in food price stability or keeping inflation low. Uh, so yes, let's, uh, let's diversify the, the uh, food basket and so on, but let's not you know, do away, let's not throw away kind transfers. The third and last point I want to make, I've got two minutes, don't worry, I'll finish in that time is that the system of procurement and distribution, by procurement we mean, I mean, I think like uh, buying of grain or buying uh, from the farmers, and the system of distribution are interlinked. Walking on two legs to use a Chinese phrase. So if we do away with food transfers, what's going to happen to the producers and procurement? And here I want to say that for a country of our size, 1.2 billion people with 863 million people food insecure, food sovereignty is essential. We cannot rely on the world food market, which is increasingly volatile 
and also in economic terms, a thin market. We cannot rely on that for our own food security. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope I've raised some issues for debate. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Alok. I lead the nutrition work with the Gates Foundation in India Country Office. Um, and first of all, I want to thank the organizers to, to provide, to give me this opportunity to be here and share a few of the perspectives that we have in our nutrition programming in India at this point of time. Uh, at the foundation, we have a common belief that all lives have equal values. And what I'll be sharing in the next three slides is a discussion around the fact that uh, based on the kind of work we are doing, um, uh, on nutrition in two of the biggest states, UP and Bihar, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Jointly, they have around 300 million population together between these two states. Contributes around 11% of global stunting. These two states in India, nine per, every nine child stunted is from uh, either of these two states. Uh, first, I wanted to share what really is there at this point of time or for nutrition work in India. I think three things really calls, uh, comes to be called out is A, the policies in India that we have around nutrition is quite evidence-based at this point of time. Uh, all the latest global evidences have been taken into consideration when the policies have been made by the government for nutrition work, um, apart from one or two areas which is missing. The second is as far as the resources are concerned, on nutrition uh, we have like, as was discussed in the previous um, uh, uh, session, uh, the whole PDS system, the amount of fund which is there with the PDS system, the whole ICDS structure is looking at the addressing the undernutrition as a problem in the in the country, and even the midday meal. These are three platforms where immense amount of fund is already available from the government side for the nutrition program. Uh, the third is about the health res human resources. Uh, I don't know many places in the world where we have for a population of thousand at the village level, not one not two, but three frontline workers available in the community, from the community, and all of them have uh, uh, in their job description services to be provided on nutrition aspect. There is Anganwadi worker with the ICDS system, she has a helper, and there is an ASHA worker with the health system. So these are there at the, at the community level in the thousand population to provide these nutrition services along with the health services, but these are the three things I would say are, are, are very strong components. Still, we see such a huge prevalence of undernutrition, stunting, wasting, and others. So I, what I want to share with you guys is one story which, from which I'll try to draw down uh, the, the missing pieces in this whole nutrition work. Uh, this is about um, last year, we had a visit with Nicholas Christoph, who's from New York Times. And we went to one of the villages in, um, in, in Lucknow, uh, near to Lucknow. And we thought of going to a village which was not very far off, very remote, so that service delivery is not a big issue over there. We thought of going to a village where we have uh, 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 not uh, like a very um, uh, income wise, not a very marginalized kind of a community over there. Uh, we, we looked at a, a village which was having good availability of diverse food products like agriculture and also the dairy products. The village we went to, this the link is uh, there for this blog on which this was shared. Uh, the village we went to had uh, was a village which was milk producing village. That's the tradition of this, this group of folks who, who, who stay there. Um, for generations they have been supporting this work. Every, every household had at least four to five uh, water buffaloes over there and they used to sell this milk into the market. Interestingly, when we went and, and kind of saw kids less than five years, this is a picture of two kids. The one on the left, Shanvi, is five years. The one on the right is Mishti. She is 28 months, almost half the age, less than half the age. Just look at the difference uh, in their size and weight. They're almost similar uh, height, and, and if you look at the weight, I think Mishti would be weighing a bit more compared to Shanvi. But she's five years, she's not even two and a half years. Mystery is not even two and a half years. And this girl, Mishti, in, in, in her mother's um, hand, lap, looked like a kind of a really monster baby in front of other kids. So there were so many kids who were looking similar to Shanvi, but hardly we could find anyone who was like uh, Mishti. So the three things we felt was very critical over here, A, 
is the lack of awareness among the caregivers, mother and family members, that how important are the key basic things, breastfeeding, complementary feeding, which doesn't require so much additional resources to be given, how that, that awareness is really lacking. The second big part is the, uh, the, the lack of uh, quality skills with the service providers or these frontline workers that I talked to really provide that support to the mother and the family members in the need to continue breastfeeding, to continue complementary feeding at that point of time. And third, I think a big lacking piece is the whole lack of prioritization on the prevention of undernutrition. There are programs existing, but when you look at with the government uh, uh, functioning of health and ICDS, and when we talk about what's, what, what are they prioritizing on nutrition, it always comes across identification of undernourished kids and management then. The focus on the prevention of this is something which is really lacking. Just because uh, we have just uh, one minute left, I wanted to also draw uh, kind of your focus on how nutrition is a kind of a missed opportunity across the preconcept, uh, the antenatal period, during delivery and post delivery. Just from the example of the antenatal care in Bihar, this is from the government NFHS 4 data. Uh, it's the same mother, same service providers, same opportunity of village health sanitation day or or home visits, but the TT immunization is as high as 90%, but the IFA coverage is not even 10%. Similarly, during institutional deliveries where you have the captive audience, in Bihar it has reached to 20, 64%, but the timely initiation is around 35%. So nutrition always kind of, you know, has a, is falling between the cracks because of this missed opportunity. And last but not the least, I wanted to share the fact that uh, if you look at these three data, this is based on the RSOC data, which, uh, uh, which was, uh, released recently, uh, and you see stunting, wasting being a, a problem across most of the states. It's not just few states are having bigger burden, it's a problem across the entire place. And I think the most talking is the situation of the low birth weight, which is a proxy indicator for the maternal nutrition status. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope these three slides could add some spices to the discussion around the complex recipe. Thank you. My presentation, I've uh, been only given six minutes, so I'll cut to the chase, but it really connects nicely with uh, sort of my two previous uh, presenters. And I'll just rephrase the, the paradox that's been put in front of you. Uh, on the one hand, saying sort of the uh, potential successes of the uh, PTS and food distribution systems, how do you square that with uh, severe lackings in, in, this, in terms of malnutrition uh, remaining in, in India? So the first point I want to make um, is, um, that I will be talking about politics, about um, um, different interest groups, how do different uh, actors um, manage and deal with this day-to-day uh, -day politics of, of managing uh, under nutrition uh, and food security uh, issues. Um, and I will focus on um, two specific paradoxes. This is part of a large uh, book manuscript that uh, we're putting together with uh, some uh, colleagues. Uh, Jenny Constantine is one of them uh, who's here present. Uh, and the first paradox is that um, hunger and malnutrition is not only a poor people's problem. Uh, put differently, economic growth is not necessarily a single most important contributor to uh, reducing hunger. Um, worldwide, there's over uh, nearly 200 million infants who are stunted, nearly 1 billion who uh, don't have enough food to eat. And this is happening despite economic growth, uh, technological improvements, reduction in poverty levels, etc. cetera. Um, the research funds uh, for Latin America that countries like Brazil and Peru make significant improvements in reducing children's malnutrition even, though, even during uh, times of economic crisis. Uh, and just to bring uh, this uh, point closer to home, um, this is a comparison, a bit messy the chart, uh, between India and Brazil, looking at different patterns of economic growth. The India is the orange line, the solid orange line, Bra Brazil is the solid uh, green line. Uh, and both countries have had their share of um, uh, volatility and, and changes in terms of economic growth. Yet uh, Brazil has managed to uh, produce a consistent and steady spending per capita on health, at least. So this is to show that uh, economic crisis is not necessarily a, a driving factor. You can still have a, a concrete commitment in terms of um, uh, government policies towards reducing uh, problems like malnutrition. I would argue in my next slide that this gap, this difference, has a concrete impact on how governments uh, approach the issue of uh, uh, nutrition. And, and the rates, uh, voila. Uh, so the second paradox is that um, 
the second nutrition paradox is um, what I call the, the Maradi paradox, uh, which is that greater availability, provision, and distribution of food, including right to food, PDS campaigns, etc., does not necessarily address or help alleviate children's undernutrition problem. Uh, worldwide. Uh, the Maradi Paradox is inspired in, in a region in Niger, which is one of the most food secure regions uh, in the country. It's lush, it's green, high agricultural production, etc. Yet it has one of the highest malnutrition rates in the country. How do you square the circle? This is probably pretty obvious to people working on this uh, issue more uh, consistently, but for me as a political scientist coming from outside, uh, I see this as a political uh, problem, as a political explanation. Um, essentially, food distribution campaigns, a commitment to reducing hunger, involved a very visible, very concrete uh, political interest. You have agricultural sector, you have uh, farmers, you have lobbying, you have demand for subsidies, you have high uh, business uh, bargaining for these things, um, whereas, when it comes to malnutrition, this is an invisible, silent audience. These are invisible constituents, the children, the mother, the poor, the ill, the uh, uh, working in, in uh, further away uh, villages. Um, and from a politician's perspective, these are less pressing uh, voters. These are less active voters. So the question is, why would governments bother to invest in addressing the needs for these constituencies, whereas the food uh, security uh, constituents it has a very concrete and very powerful uh, lobby. Um, I will refer to some work done by my colleagues at IDS. Uh, this is the uh, Hansi Index, Hunger and Nutrition Commitment Index, and they have put together a series of uh, indicators looking at um, the commit country's commitment to hunger reduction, which include indicators such as government spending in agriculture, access to land, agricultural extension services, constitutional right to food, women's access to land, very much along the lines of what we have been talking uh, here today. Um, and there is a different uh, nutrition commitment, nutrition index commitment, which uh, looks at drinking water, sanitation, vitamin A, international code for breast milk substitutes, multi-sectoral coordination, very much along the lines of uh, what uh, my, my colleague was saying earlier. Uh, and in the case of Brazil, if you combine, this is a com um, comparison of 44 countries for which they have managed to address indicators. If you're curious about the details, this is the website. Um, Brazil has a combined Hansi index of fifth in the 44 countries, with a fourth in the nutrition commitment, ninth in hunger nutrition commitment. This has, I claim, a very concrete impact on outcomes uh, in terms of uh, Brazil being one of the countries uh, that has virtually reduced and nearly eliminated some of the nutrition aspects, malnutrition aspects in Latin America. How does this compare to a country like India, where you have still a fairly high, even higher uh, index of hunger reduction commitment, coming to the fact that uh, there are public uh, PTS systems, a constitutional right to food, et cetera, et cetera, when it comes to uh, nutrition commitment, it ranks 30th out of 44 countries. This is uh, the multi-sectoral uh, issue that uh, my colleague was talking about. What other aspects go into nutrition? What other um, factors play out? And how does, do governments address this silent majority that is going undernourished uh, on a regular basis? Uh, and the uh, results are quite uh, impressive, uh, with India having uh, um, you know, multiple times more uh, undernourished children uh, than Brazil, um, for a country that you know, is equally uh, an economic powerhouse, but uh, with indicators that are closer to many African countries, actually. Uh, and this is something that uh, should not be um, tolerated in this day and age in terms of uh, growth and technological innovation, et cetera. So I'll finish with uh, this point that um, the nutrition challenge in India is purely political. How I see it is a problem of um, nutrition governance. Uh, and there are many questions that beg uh, answering, including how to encourage government coordination across sector and across the frontiers, um, how to coordinate public and private interest, how to facilitate government and civil society uh, coalitions and alliances, and how to coordinate different funding models. I think these are some pending questions for the discussion session, uh, and that I hope the center is very, very well placed to address. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, this morning, Tim Lang used the words, the environment, obviously. Uh, we haven't heard much about the environment. Uh, 
So I'm going to talk about that in the framework of the common agricultural policy of the EU. Uh, Alfie asked me to talk about this on the 24th of June, which is very bad timing on his part. I was too depressed. But anyway, so common agricultural policy, as I'm sure you know, has developed as a system of subsidies to farmers. It's a very complex process, but basic, the basic aim is really aimed at supporting agricultural production. Um, but over the period of the uh, uh, common agricultural policy, starting from the 1960s, it became increasingly clear that activities to increase agricultural production, such as use of agrochemicals, change cropping patterns, intensive grazing, a lot of other things, have had a hugely negative effect on the environment, with uh, measured uh, impacts on pollution of waterways, declines in biodiversity such as birds and bees, soil erosion, greenhouse gas production, a great range of bad news stories. But the CAP did ref respond to this uh, back in the 1990s. The CAP was reformed to include what were called agri-environment schemes to try to counter these negative impacts. And these agri-environment schemes were uh, options available to farmers, for which farmers would get paid, to reverse these, uh, these negative impacts, such as planting of wildflower margins, sowing plants to provide food for birds during the winter, decrease, decreased grazing, lower fertilizer use, a great range of options which have been developed and researched. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about those, but what I want to address is the idea that these payments are based on the idea that environmentally friendly farming is at the cost of production. You've got production, which is damaging the environment. You do stuff for the environment, that damages production. And on that basis, CAP pays farmers on the basis of income foregone. If they do environmentally friendly activities, they're going to lose a production, uh, income from their farm production. But let's think about whether environmentally friendly farming should necessarily decrease production. Um, there's a couple of uh, uh, narratives which might suggest otherwise, and there are many others. I haven't got time to go into them. But one is that we know many crops need pollination. We know that things, these wildflower margins that are encouraged in agri-environment schemes encourage bees and other insects that pollinate crops. And similarly, and even more importantly, these margins encourage uh, things such as ground beetles, parasitic wasps, <coughs> ladybirds, etc., all of which can feed on crop pests such as aphids and other things. So over the last few years, there's been increasing speculation and debate whether certain aspects of environmentally farming um, might benefit forms farmers and uh, production, agricultural production, rather than have negative impacts. <coughs> but it's not really been tested. And uh, so I'm going to go into a very specific UK-based example to show the possibilities. And we tested this idea, not that far from here, in Buckinghamshire, on a very highly productive arable farm called the Hilson Experiment. And this is work funded by DEFRA. And in this, we contrasted what you might call standard farming, where the farmer grows his crops to the edge of the field, with a sort of standard agri-environment option where about 3% of fields or 3% of areas of fields were planted with these sort of wildflower margins. And we also had an enhanced option where about 8% of fields were planted or 8% of area of fields were planted with these wildflower margins. And these fields went through your standard agricultural rotation of this part of the world, uh, winter wheat, all-seed rape, field beans, and we measured uh, production amongst many other things over six years. And we had a number of interesting findings. I haven't got time to go into all of them, but one is quite general, but we find that crop yield tends to drop off quite massively towards the edge of fields. So about in the sort of five meters from the edge of the field, um, the cr uh, crop yield has, is decreases by about 40% through probably things such as soil compaction. So planting um, crops, on, uh, so removing these from the cropping system is not, has the potential not to be that damaging in terms of production. Um, but more interestingly, we also found that planting wildflower margins in these fields actually increased yield in the remaining area. And this was probably through enhanced pest control especially, but also pollination. And certainly we found the animals doing these activities were more abundant in these, these fields. And if we looked at the field scale, 
we found that uh, this enhanced production meant that overall for wheat and all seed rate, there was no decrease in, um, in production at the field scale. And actually for field beans, which benefits very strongly from pollination, there was actually an increase overall in yield, despite the fact a smaller area was farmed. And um, if we look at this in terms of economics, uh, this is my back of the envelope ecologist economics, I shouldn't really be staying here, but just in terms of gross margins of uh, accounting for the area lost in crop in margins, the increases in the yield and the cost in seed and agrochemicals, we find these three um, types of treatment, uh, there's different colors of the, the, the value of the different crops. We find overall there's no difference amongst them. And in fact, the, the standard agri-environment one is slightly higher than the others in a, in a five-year rotation of three wheat, one all seed rape and one bean. And so in this case, we find that planting wildflower margins has actually resulted in no loss in terms of farming yield and a potential increase. And so to take this very specific study uh, and the various other bits of evidence around, it does suggest that we should not see agricultural production and environmental protection as at opposite ends of the spectrum, that it should not as opposed. And I would suggest we should be looking at ways, not just in the UK, but globally, to develop approaches which enhance the farmed environment, which also has positive effects on food production. <laughs> You've finished there. Okay, um, I've just about finished as well. But just to say, I mentioned about production here, but given what's been talked about, it needn't necessarily just be production, it may be food quality and various other things. It's a, certainly a very unresearched area, but one which is very interesting, new findings arising. It'll be quite important, I hope. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I suppose one of the common features that came out of the discussions that we've had, the, each of the speeches, is that when you intervene, as we have heard in all these different circumstances, you create people who have an interest in the circumstances which have arisen. So you may decide to intervene in order to improve the uh, uh, ability of people to eat. You may wish to get rid of hunger. It may be that you want to improve the uh, environmental circumstances of the countryside. You may seek to improve the nutrition. You can do all those things, but in every case, you create a new group of people who are dependent upon the system that you have established. And, and as somebody who for many years was a minister and a politician, I have to say there's a huge problem that arises then. Because um, you create a whole group of people who are going to be extremely angry if you take away from them what it is they have. And now that may not be the immediate recipients, but it may be people who provide for the immediate recipients, the distributors, the, the farmers, the, 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 the people who run the uh, lorries, the people who actually run the storehouses, whatever it may be, they're those people. And you also discover that if you have taken away something from someone and given it to someone else, the balance is not that those who get the new uh, support are grateful. Politically, <laughs> there is little gratitude. And therefore, what politicians learn is that it is never right to talk about a balance. When you take it away, you get it in the neck. When you give it, somebody suggests that they ought to have had it anyway. And why haven't you given it to them very much sooner? So I do think we have to face the fact that we are in a serious position because unless you take the extreme American Republican view that therefore you should never intervene anywhere on anything, unless you do that, and I, I did have to do a, a discussion with uh, staffers from American uh, uh, congressmen and senators who were Republicans but beginning to understand that climate change might actually be happening. So they were <laughs> slightly <laughs> unusual compared with many. But uh, in the middle of this, one of these young men said, well, I don't believe in any kind of intervention whatsoever, anywhere. 
uh, we started to discuss whether he thought they ha ought to have an army or not, and that was quite a good place for him to find his case doesn't actually stand up. So unless you take that position, I think in a sense what you've all shown us is that wherever and whatever you are trying to do, you create a whole lot of unex very often unexpected, certainly unintended circumstances, which are very difficult to correct. And I suppose what we really ought to be talking about a bit to start with is what sort of correction can you reasonably do? And are there ways of injecting into the system a degree of self-correction? Because that also is important. And I was very interested to listen to our first speaker on the, on the Indian situation. Now, can I press her a bit on this? Because it seemed to me just listening to it, in, in, in a, 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 a applying, if you like, a, a Western view, is this is a very complicated system that has been established. And part of its problem is simply its complication, it is that it is so big, so it is, has so many people dependent upon it, that the possibility of radical change is probably not there. So the question may not be, uh, should we change it? It might possibly be, could we change it? Is there a way that any government in India could change seriously what you have? Okay, I, I don't speak for any government, <laughs> but I, let, let me, let me uh, give my view on this. Uh, I think that what you say is uh, every country, every program, there's an institutional history. And I think some people who just come along, uh, I would name them as advisors who fly in and say things, it's not, it's not feasible to do what they say is do away with the whole system because there's a history, there's a 60, 70 year history. And I think any change we build has to take that into account, otherwise we'd be fools. And as you say, you will get the stick from both ends. But on the second thing that, yes, is change possible? I think it is, and we have a good example in India because uh, we have 28 states. And this policy of public distribution system actually uh, is uh, a state subject in India. So it's not the central government that decides on the actual policies. So you have Tamil Nadu, you have Kerala, you have each state which has variations on the model. And I think over the last 10, 15 years or more, we've had a lot of study on these variations. And I'll just take one example, which is a, a southern state of Tamil Nadu to which I sort of nominally belong, I've never really lived there, um, which has, um, and people in this room have written about it for political reasons, it was a very clear political decision, and I think this is uh, to in fact not only expand the public distribution system, but it was the first a state in India to introduce the lunch noon meal program, which has then become the midday meal program. And it was attacked as populist. But if feeding the people is populist, then you know, so, so be it. So I think that, and Tamil Nadu has been in the forefront in terms of now using GPS technology to monitor these lorries. There's a lot of change in the way this food is distributed. They're in the forefront, they're the only state in India to actually have urban food kitchens, which is an idea that some other countries like Brazil have had, because as you have more urban populations and migrant population, you don't want to give them a bag of gro you know, groceries to take home and cook. They want food which is available uh, cheaply. So I think that we have examples from states in India which show there is the possibility of change, and I'm actually, uh, that's what sort of makes you optimistic about. We can do things in terms of introducing, say, millets, which are more nutritious cereals into the public distribution system. Maharashtra and Karnataka governments have taken a lead. So again, so the model's being tried out in different places. And uh, I mean, ideally, we but, want but, the but best it, of them. Uh, but, but when we looked at the difference between the efficacy of the situation in, in India and the efficacy as far as malnutrition is concerned in Brazil, 
should that not, at some stage, have a real impact in what happens, let's say, in Tamil Nadu? Because all that has happened in Tamil Nadu is that they've been more efficient in delivering the food. They've been a bit uh, wider in the distribution. But uh, there doesn't seem to be much indication that they've actually improved malnutrition to the same degree as the Brazilians. It's, I think that was an excellent, in fact, I use the India-Brazil-Mexico comparison often. One, India at per capita income levels is much below Brazil and Mexico, let's not forget that. Per capita health expenditure, per capita food expenditure, per capita education expenditure in India is much lower than in Brazil or Mexico. We're not spending enough, but Tamil Nadu, and that's what uh, some others may know the uh, numbers better, National Family Health Survey. Tamil Nadu levels of malnutrition are much lower than the Indian average and have declined at faster rates than the Indian average, if I'm, if I'm right. So yes, there has been some change, but not dramatic. And that's because we're not spending enough. And I think that the point you made that, you know, we haven't got to those levels of per capita expenditure as Brazil or Mexico. But are there other hidden things? If I come back to the Brazilian example, I mean, one of the things that I've always been interested in is the degree to which the involvement of women uh, is crucial in, in all this. That if women are involved much more effectively, not just in the food distribution, but in the aspect of nutrition of their children. I'm interested to see whether you think that there is a greater involvement of women in the Brazilian situation, which is my uh, estimation from sure. my knowledge of sure, Brazil, sure, which sure. is greater than, I must say, uh, than of India. But, uh, but I, I, I wonder whether that's true. Sure, sure, sure. I, I probably would be in the best position to, to answer your question about the role of women. My, my colleague, uh, Jenny, who's here, uh, who's worked in Brazil, is probably the best uh, place to do that. But there is, uh, I very much like your point about um, how these different policies generate entitlements that are very difficult to track back on. Uh, and in the case of Brazil, part of the uh, success story of generating a, an entitlement, or in this case, a, a, a stable commitment towards reducing nutrition, is precisely the, uh, this inclusiveness of the political system, the different actors that come together into shaping different levels of policy making. So for example, uh, there is this uh, capillarity effect by which you have uh, consultations at the uh, um, municipal level, regional level, state level, and going all the way up to the national level. Or for example, um, uh, dynamics by which different political parties engage and, and become in contact with different lobbying groups in order to secure these, these rights that have been uh, um, fought for, you know, the, particularly for the PT, by the PT, but uh, other, other parties as well. And this is something I don't see so clearly, at least in the Indian case, where um, you have a lot of civil society activism, you have a lot of participation, certainly no shortage of energy coming from civil society. But the extent to which they uh, interact with the political system, with political parties, with the politicians on a regular basis, that I think it's, it's one, one gap that has not been uh, looked at closely. Uh, certainly in, in, in the Indian case, there's a, a tendency to um, appeal directly to the courts to you know, demand an, uh, uh, an effective uh, implementation of rights to food. And, and that's well and fine. But the intermediate stakeholders, the, the layers, the brokers of, of these uh, connections um, seem to be absent from the perspective where I'm looking at things. I mean, have you, is that what you found in your, your experience? I mean, that seems directly to, to press on the examples you've been giving. So a few things has to be like looked into the perspective of whether it's, nothing has happened in addressing the undernutrition in India, India's context or not. If you look at the data that I showed from RSOC, the Rapid Survey of Children, which was a re recent data uh, with UNICEF and Ministry of Women and Child Development, uh, it clearly brings out examples of many states in India which have reduced the reduction in stunting and uh, as, as good as few of the other South Asian countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, where we always quote the examples of how it has been reduced in Bangladesh, how it has been reduced in Nepal. But we need to celebrate those success stories of how few states have been able to do that in India, and there are examples available. I think second point which I also would want to put over here is the entire, uh, what you were mentioning about the political commitment. I think uh, few of the states, in, in India right now, there are eight states which have state nutrition mission. Um, it, it really needs to be seen that uh, these uh, state nutrition mission, how much are the implementation that they are looking at is evidence-based. 
because when we looked at the, the goals they have set in the states, out of these eight, two are really quite evidence-based. Six are not so much driven by like the WHO World Health uh, Assembly targets or the Sustainable Development Goal targets which are uh, adopted by India and other countries. Uh, so it needs to be seen that if India has to achieve... What are they driven by then? Uh, so very interestingly, like um, uh, there are uh, major push around in few of the states around identifying the uh, severely underweight children. Uh, but the, what will really prevent the child from being undernourished is the whole behavior change around things like around those thousand days window of opportunity for mother and child, the first two years of life, breastfeeding, complementary feeding. But that doesn't become a huge priority in the implementation. That doesn't become a huge priority in, in, in the monitoring system. The monitoring system focuses a lot on identifying of the underweight child, identifying of the undernourished child. Mm -hmm. uh, but what will really prevent them from being to that level is what really need, would be kind of the, the icebreaker in this whole thing, I feel. Of course, that's a problem in the, in, in the Western world as well. I mean, as a politician, I have to say, the, the, we know, all know perfectly well that the problem with obesity, for example, is actually a problem the first five years. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go in for demand feeding, which is one of the great wickednesses descended upon people, if you go in for demand yeah. feeding, and then you uh, have, so you have children who double their, uh, treble their weight in the first six months instead of doubling it, um, and then you, then they feel that food is comfort too, because every time they cry, they, it's a comfort thing, and therefore they grow up. In the, by the time they're five, uh, there is a pattern of behaviour which is extremely difficult to break. But politicians don't like dealing with that because it means intervention in circumstances in places. It's really uh, where they are not welcome mm -hmm. and where they know there will be trouble. So this is the reverse of having to uphold interventions because you have got people who, who feel that they deserve it and must have it and they've always had it. This is the other way around, that there are certain kinds of intervention which are very, very difficult for politicians. And that seems to me to be really parallel in the Indian situation, because one of the reasons why you'd prefer to count than actually intervene is that intervention is both difficult and resented, because in most communities, whether they are so-called developed or less developed, the fact is that that's an area that is felt to be something the state or the authorities should not intervene in. And, and, and the odd thing for me is that it all seems to be uh, much more widespread and universal than you might think if we were just talking about developing countries. Not So I want to come back to, to, to you. I mean, here, here we're in a situation in which, uh, uh, in, uh, and I put it very bluntly, uh, the British people have made probably the stupidest decision that they've made for a very long time. And uh, it's, uh, it is actually an example of uh, the biggest piece of self-harm done by any nation, I think, for 200 years. It is a terrible thing to have done. One of the set of people who managed to do that were farmers. Now, I just wonder if I'd try this out on you. I mean, I don't think there will be any farming subsidies in uh, non-European uh, Britain because there is no demand by a sufficiency of the electorate to make that particular activity worthwhile. Money which could be spent much more widely elsewhere. So I just wonder about your environmental proposals, and I'm an enthusiast for it, and I'm a bit of a farmer myself, so I care, but it's all done on an organic basis, and only because I don't have to make any money out of it, otherwise I would be in trouble. But I merely make the point, do you, do you think that we're now going to have to talk about these things in an entirely different way, given that we don't have the huge advantage of the support of French, German and other par uh, farmers? Well, it's obviously a very big question, but I mean, I, I share your concern that why would a government support the farming sector when it's such a minor input to the gross domestic product, it's such a minor employer in the nation as a whole, and it'd be so costly to maintain it and support it. So there are various possibilities of how things will turn out. Uh, one is a total collapse of the subsidy system or maybe some minor version of it. Um, but to cut to the chase, that say, I mean, there's various trajectories. One is land abandonment, and so we get conservation by the back door of rewilding, which is a few weeks ago seemed like a mad idea and it's become much more 
mind you, as leaving you seem a mad idea. There are many mad ideas happening. Um, but I guess on this particular thing, I, I, in a way, the way we're thinking about sustainable agriculture is hope, hopefully taking it away from the state level intervention and thinking more about what's in it for farmers. And this is a very idealistic and optimistic view. I think it needs a lot of development and ideas. But um, if there are things which farmers can do, which enhance the environment and also at the very best does not damage their yield or the quality of their yield, there is a potential there. And the reason I think there's the potential, because if you go and work with farms and talk to farms, they're not as portrayed maybe in the environmental sector or in the newspapers as rapacious um, destroyers of the land. Many of them have a very a strong environmental focus. They like seeing wildlife on the farm, etc. So if one can tap that and show in certain ways that environmental benefit does not mean decreased production, in fact, you can work with it in some ways, there's a hope there. I think it's a slim hope because it's a massive educational process. A lot of farmers don't see or understand that. If we withdraw subsidies, there could be some huge New Zealand-type reorganisation of the sector, maybe back to a very uh, a, a productionist focus. So I think that's a glimmer. That's all it is at the moment. But it's at least if they can get benefits from the environment rather than just polluter pays type things, that if they damage the environment, they have to pay for it. There's a potential. But it's very gloomy, I think. So gloom, uh, concern at the speed with which change can take place, I think. Particular cheer in some areas, but not in others. And uh, some real examples of where things have been changed considerably. I want to leave you, though, with one other point before we spread to the tables, and it's simply this. Um, we've had three people talk about uh, countries where food, uh, where hunger and malnutrition are particularly uh, issues. And one to talk about countries where that is in general not true. We talked in the one that where it wasn't true about the environmental aspect of it. One of the questions I want people at the tables to think about is uh, do we not have to think seriously about the environmental impacts uh, even in countries where malnutrition is so enormous a pressure? Because a world which doesn't take that into account will in fact not produce uh, as it ought to produce. I remind you of an earlier discussion when you saw those poor old cows eating um, uh, paper bag, I mean, uh, plastic bags and the like. Uh, I remind you that the British soil has uh, uh, been seriously affected, probably 10% less fertile today than it was 20 years ago. I remind you that the environment and the ability to produce food uh, are inextricably linked and that the issues we've talked about should not become a divided area between the rich and the poor world. Because the idea that you would consign India to be a country where nobody cared about the environment seems to me just as insulting as uh, many of the other divisions that we have between the first world and the rest. So I hope uh, every table will think seriously about where the environment comes in in a country in which there is malnutrition, and then perhaps where the issues of proper nutrition come in in countries where the environment is actually a serious concern. Once again, I think we need to learn from one another. Uh, without harping on the subject, I got fed up with a campaign in which everyone was saying, what do we get out of it, rather than saying, what can we give to it, which will make it better for all of us. So we've now got 20 minutes for every table to produce some really stunning answers. And uh, I hope you will argue effectively. And could I, on your behalf, thank all those who've started us off so well. Thank you.